Okay, so I'm going to each ask each of the panel members to comment on um, issues that I'm seeing in my own clinic. Let's start with the clinical trial that was just reported uh, with HMAs sh showed no laboratory clinical evidence of tumor lysis syndrome. In the, in the low-dose ARC uh, study, there were two patients had clinical uh, laboratory evidence, but no clinical, okay? Um, as I've begun to use this, I have seen definitely laboratory evidence of tumor lysis syndrome, and I've been quite happy um, when I've had these patients hospitalized because I was worried what would have happened if they right. weren't. And, and there are cases that have happened that had true cl clinical uh, TLS that have happened, uh, including patients who went into full-blown renal failure, did need dialysis. It wasn't captured on the trial, which suggests that it's rare, but it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Um, so you need to be aware and prepared for that. And we, we have actually followed the recommendations that came from the trial and that are on the label in terms of monitoring of these patients. Does that mean that everybody is at the same level of, of risk? I don't think that means everyone's at the same level of risk. And we have also done the ramp up in the dose, starting low and then increasing out of concern that there may be some dose-dependent effect right. here. This is not the CLL ramp up, though. It's 100, no, 200, No, no, it's over 400. just a few days. But, but, so. but remind me if I'm wrong, but on the trial, you were not allowed to have, like, for example, a white count of 70,000. That's important. I mean, patients right, yeah. that were enrolled on the trial had to have a white count of Correct. below but 30. But not a de novo white count. I mean, you were permitted right. to get them down with hydrea or But I think phoresis. that's an important distinction it because is. you don't yes. want people in the community to have a, so an AML start. walk in there with a white count of, like, 50 I, or 100 and them starting yes. potentially the venatoclax immediately. There, there were immediately. significant mitigation techniques that were employed on all patients in the clinical trial, getting the, the, the white blood cell count down, using allopurinol in every patient, very aggressive hydration um, uh, measures, inpatient hospitalization, the intra-patient dose escalation. Right. So, you know, I mean, I think that accounts for a, a, a large amount of the, uh, of, the, of the lack of tumor lysis syndrome. And, it, and like we've been saying, it really does need to be respected. I, I agree with the mitigation attempts, but getting back to Eunice's point, I completely agree only 10% of the patients who went on that trial required hydroxyurea. Right. And when you look at the demographics, about a quarter to a third had what we used to call MDS, right? 20 to 30% right. blast. Right, they had and lower level disease had lower than level. maybe you're seeing yeah. in the community, right? But patients with real leukemia, I, I had, I do what was done in the study, I admit them to, to begin sure. treatment. And, and I agree with that. I mean, and when we look at the patients on the study, I mean, it's, it's actually very uh, somewhat deceiving because the FDA indication is for uh, individuals 75 and above who have significant comorbidities, maybe not uh, eligible for intensive chemotherapy. And one interpretation of that is if you have an 85-year-old gentleman coming in that's in a wheelchair that has AML, um, maybe a white, high white count, that that person would be an ideal candidate for, for venanoclax therapy. And the temptation is based on our CLL colleagues is maybe we'll just do this as an outpatient. Well, I mean, I, I think that's, again, it's, it's very deceiving. I mean, I think that, I, again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, a significant proportion, I mean, half of the patients on the trials were actually under the age of 75. They did have a performance status of zero to two uh, to meet eligibility. Uh, most of them, and, and again, uh, my impression is that because of the fear of and, and the close monitoring and the need for hydrea and hydrea, hydration, allopurinol. Most of the patients in that study did receive their initial ramp up and their initial course in hospital. And there was, although there was a, about a 6% 30-day mortality, um, it, again, some of these individuals were not 80-something years old in a wheelchair. They were uh, 60, 65. They were walking around. They were ambulatory. Some of them may even, in some centers, been considered candidates for even intensive chemotherapy based on well, that criteria. 10% went on to the reason they're not a good candidate is they have a bad heart or bad kidneys or yeah. things that make it right. hard to give them appropriate the other aspect of that is, is the prolonged myelosuppression. Yeah. Well, that's why yeah. I was going to come yeah. to you next about how, tell us more about the myelosuppression and how do you manage it? This, do you just keep going with the venetoclax? Do, you, do you admit them at MD Anderson? Well, we admit them for the ramp up. We, we, we can discharge them, uh, but, 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 but it's important because of what you were, we, you were mentioning, that the label is for, for these uh, older patients and fragile patients and, and whatever. And, and I think the drug is safe. Uh, you know, I think that the drug is safe. It's just that it needs proper management. So I think that the, the, what's important is that for people to recognize at the beginning what we just discussed, but then there's this prolonged myelosuppression. These patients have to be monitored continuously and, and recognize that these, the, the myelosuppression is gonna stay there to do your prophylactic antimicrobials, make sure that you protect them. Uh, that you educate them that they need to come 
to the emergency center if they're already out right away with the first fever and and, and treat that aggressively. You know, because a 75, 80 year old who develops a, 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 an infectious complication is not going to handle it as well as a 40 year old. I mean, mostly old. respiratory infections, pulmonary infiltrates, exactly. sepsis, those were the so main I causes think of that death. It is very important to recognize that, to again manage that uh, preemptively with prophylaxis, with transfusions, with you know, all these things, um, education of the patients, you know, keeping a close eye on, on these patients. Now, do you keep them in the hospital or not? I don't know. I think that depends on how you keep them. That may be safe or not. Uh, you know, if, if they're going to be in the hospital and catch a nosocomial infection as, as opposed to a community-acquired infection, it may not be a good trade-off as long as the patient can be uh, close and, and but come it, But you right initially away. start out in the hospital during their Oh, ramp definitely. Up. They have to start. The, the they question have is to start. if the myelosuppression is prolonged, you keep them there six weeks or eight right. weeks in the hospital, and, right. and, and that's where it and becomes, one, you know, what's the benefit. One, yeah. one really critical piece of the management of the myelosuppression that, we, uh, that the message needs to get out in is, you know, most of these patients, they achieve a remission after the first cycle, you know, very early on. Um, we need to institute breaks between cycles. Yeah, yeah. So this is not, uh, this is not a, a, a a situation where you know you stay on schedule every 28 days like you might with in the early days of azacitidine alone to get through your four to six cycles and manage the cytopenias and the expectation that hopefully you'll be able this is you know if you can achieve a remission or some degree of response very early on then you can take a break off of therapy and allow count recovery before the next cycle. And in our group we've important. made it a, a, a group-wide approach to do a bone marrow biopsy three to four weeks into therapy. And that's what we've done too. To see are they do. usually a plaque actually yeah. at that point Correct. and if they are and we, we stop the therapy mm -hmm. and we may even give growth factor at that yep. point. Growth factors are great. Yeah. So I, I agree with all that's a very important management issue you know you don't just continue to do a marrow most respond 60 65 percent required dose interruptions mm -hmm. on the trial mm -hmm. um, but let me get back to the the maintenance issue because then you start them back on it right and you know if they were if you were just giving them azacitidine they're in a complete remission I don't see count suppression on, stand, on azacitidine once they're in a complete remission. But I continue to see count repression here. So my question to you, Dan, is do you keep people on 28 days or are you lowering the dose or lowering the duration? What are people doing? I think all of the above, um, you know, so I, I don't think there's a great, you know, solid algorithm, but, you know, we certainly have decreased the duration of the venetoclax from 28 to 21 days. Um, we have decreased the dose or the duration of the uh, hypomethylator. Um, uh, you know, what I have found is that it is not necessarily uh, true that count suppression uh, correlates with uh, bad infectious outcomes or any sort of, uh, uh, you know, bleeding outcomes or anything like that. Um, and if for many patients, they reach some equilibrium where while their counts may be suppressed, they're not requiring transfusion support, they feel well, they're, you know, they're free from infectious complications. So I think sort of managing that sort of expectation for full count recovery versus, you know, uh, a, a, an allowance for some count suppression in a patient that you acknowledge you're indefinitely treating with a myelosuppressive regimen. So like an ALL type of maintenance where you're going to give effective therapy, but adjust the dose, either the dose per day or the duration, so that you can have some count suppression, but not too much. But clearly we have to take, take notice of this, right? Sure. Oh, yeah, okay. uh, yeah that, and, and we do adjust it to, you know, once they go in remission, we, we cut yeah. back to half a month later, sometimes yeah. the and yeah. Yeah, So here, I just wanted to bring yeah. up a couple other practical points just yeah. from our, our own experiences. That first of all, as Dan alluded to, you know, you don't have to wait four or six cycles as you do with HMA alone to get a response. Uh, we've had some colleagues do that, and really um, the data suggests that you do get a response within the first one or two cycles. So if you're not going to respond after two cycles, it may be good to start looking for the next thing. Um, uh, to use. The second thing we've uh, run into issues with is a lot of these patients uh, get neutropenic and they're, they get placed on azoles. Uh, and, and one error that, that uh, early on we were making is we were continuing to give full dose uh, of venetoclax and there is an interaction. So just something to mention that long term, particularly when you get into that maintenance phase uh, where you may or may not be on and off the venetoclax, to know that the doses of venetoclax really have to be dramatically decreased in the presence of, of azole depending on the azole. 
is all that you have. Yeah, the, the PI actually says you go down to 70 milligrams of venetoclax if you're on a strong CYP3A4 inhibitor. Of course, that means your patient has to pay for a 15 to 20 milligram pill. I just give 100 milligrams in that situation. But you, you know what's interesting about this discussion is that, remember I started by saying, I'm gonna ask each of you a question about what are the challenges of managing patients? And I didn't even have to get to the questions. You, I mean, <laughs> you, these are things that we're all facing Absolutely. every day. And I think it's really important because this is a, a regimen that is very uh, useful for patients, but it has to be given safely. There's a lot of nuances. And, and yeah. I think it's important to recognize there are patients for whom this may not be the best therapy. As much as we can look at the data and say, this really looks better than what we're used to seeing, not everybody is a good candidate for this in the front line. But, but I do want to emphasize, I mean, because we've talked about all the problems. It's a safe regimen. Oh, absolutely. It just needs yeah. skilled, it, attentive care yeah. of the patient, yeah. good selection of the patient. It, it, you know, it, it is it is a safe regimen, but we, you you need yeah. to know. How, but how I, how I to don't do think it. they're characterizing it. I mean, people say, well, there's high intensity therapy and then there's low intensity therapy. You know, in some of my discussions, yeah. I'm not sure why I would really call this. And, and I know you're going to talk about glastigib in a minute. Um, a really low. I don't think venetoclax HMA. And I'm not yeah. sure I would qualify it as a well, a very low intensity from, from therapy. From the myosuppressive point of view, sure. You know, I mean, I would think it's sort of like an intermediate. Very little. Right. 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 Yeah. I would think that it's not like yeah. HMA alone or L deck alone, um, certainly much more intensive than that, but not quite as much as our standard 7 plus 3.